recording while I write names down. Okay, <clears throat> got those all there. We're on chapter 12, if I'm recalling correctly, this week. Yes. So we're on module 12, and module 12 is going into um, IP version 6. And I throw you a lot of information in the chapter that probably is a certain amount of confusion on it. But, um, and trying to figure out how they do their addressing does get more complicated on it with IP version 6. Come back over to where the chat is. And let me turn my speaker on so now I can hear also. Um, there you go. So, and that I heard the tail end of that or whatever. Um, so, IP version 6 has actually been around since around 99, 98, 99, um, 2000, somewhere in that 99, 2000 range right there. Um, pretty sure about 99, because I remember when it was introduced. IP version 5 was on the drawing boards there in the early 90s, and it was intended to do other things than expanding the number of addresses. Um, and IP version 6 does that stuff, plus expand the number of addresses, because when they were working on 5, their bigger concern was um, making it secure and some things like that. Um, and then the World Wide Web burst on the scene and changed the whole world. Um, so then they went to developing IP version 6, carrying over stuff they were doing, working on doing for 5 and did it in a hurry up fashion to get it done because we were running into a crisis. Uh, with IP version 4, um, we have 4.3 billion addresses available. And we really don't have that many because when we looked at it last week, if you remember, there's a lot of wastage of addresses on the way it was set up. And that did change at that time too, to where it's more efficient, but there's still a large wastage out there. Um, IP version six gives you 340 new decillion addresses. And I'm never exactly sure how to pronounce that one, but <laughs> Undecillion, undecillion, something. I've heard it pronounced all kinds of ways. Uh, basically, that's 340 with 36 zeros after that. Um, so it is a huge number. I have read in some places, which I really not totally believe, that that um, is more than the number of sand granite granules in the world. Uh, I'm not sure about that one. But in any event, it is a huge number there. Um, with the predictions when they came out with it of that a number of people saying we'd never outgrow that number. And my comments from that point and still are is that at some point we will outgrow that number. And probably much sooner than anybody expects. Um, you know, something will happen and all of a sudden we grow. Because if we went back to 1980, or approximately whichever year that was, the IP version 4 was developed. And then when they developed the um, public private addressing scheme and put the private addresses in there, which was RFC 
1918, I believe, what it was, because that's been mentioned by Security Plus class several times. It's either 1918 or 1812, and I really think it was 1918. Um, the 1812 makes sense too. One of those is the number. Um, the guy keeps mentioning it, but I haven't ever seen RFC numbers, really. I don't remember seeing them on certification test or test, and he's talking to us about the certification test. Um, and he keeps mentioning three of them. I say 1918, 1812, and several others. And it looks like 1812 probably was private addressing. Um, it's not looking at it. And it actually dates 1812 is requirements for IPv4 routers. Because it's about the IPv4 routers. It looks like requirements on them. But maybe it's the other one. Okay. Okay, 1918's private addressing. So it is 1918. Um, that's when they came up with the private addressing scheme that we mentioned last week about the 10, the 192.168, and the 172.1 through 131. Um, and that actually dates back to... Before, before I learned to walk. It says 1996 here, but that's the best practice. That's silicon graphics. It dates from before then. Um, Cause wasn't that developed around the, the military? Back in the day? The maybe internet before protocol 19 was, but private addressing I know was there before then cause we talked about it when I was taking courses and setting up the school's network in the early 90s um i know silicon graphics was not involved with this um but yet this has a 1996 date on it and that i just don't really believe that date on that it should be before then maybe they were Maybe they did come up with that. And, and their references go back to 93. Um, now maybe they did come out with private addressing in 96, but I really got my doubts on that one. But that's what it looks like the RFC is saying. Um, so I guess private addresses existed. But we didn't. But when we were setting up, the only networking I was setting up was on, connected to the internet was the ones I set up on. And, well, I set up some private networks, but we didn't do any IP addressing on them. So I really didn't ever deal with that back then. So I guess so. But um, Silicon Graphics was a big one at that point. Um, so in any event, in any event, the um, IP version 4 had problems. And even with that on that private addressing that they pulled off, that they probably pulled more addressing than was needed out of being able to use on the other, although it came in handy. Um, that, um, so there's that approach on the whole thing. Um, we went from 32-bit addresses in IP version 4 to to be able to do that huge number at 340 and decillion 
um, addresses that we went to 128 bit addresses. Um, we did go with NAT, um, did come along at that same time period there and solved the problem of us running out of addresses there in the late 90s. And I remember the headlines on different computer magazines and stuff about us running out of addresses at that time that we had run out of IP version 4 addresses. Um, but NAT was arriving on scene too, and NAT allowed us to set up private addressing within organizations and then outside and only have a address on the outside or using NAT or a proxy server to do it. Typically NAT. Um, and that that in turn solved our problems there for a good while. So IP version 6 had arrived and started being introduced. Well, one of the big problems with IP version 6 was that it wasn't just that you needed to re-address all your stuff, but you had to um, either update your equipment or get new equipment that ran your networks, including running your down to the PC, anything connected to the network to be able to handle those addresses and work with IP version 6 and its setup. Um, so that was a definite major problem, and so they started, all manufacturers started making equipment that would work with IP version 6 and IP version 4, which is what you're buying today. So by now, um, essentially everything out there will work with IP version 6. There's probably some pieces of equipment still sitting around in some places that's old, that's still handling some things. That may be IP version 4 only, but I've got doubts on if there really is that's in use, but it could be. Um, the federal government has certified for several years now that um, their equipment that they have a day each year since back in like 2007 or so, um, it was in the Bush administration, um, that um, they Everybody, all the agencies of the federal government are supposed to test their equipment, make sure they can run on IP version 6. And they're actually supposed to run that day just using IPv6, which I think occurs in May each year, if I remember right. Um, there is an IPv6 day also, um, which encourages the same thing. And that may well be the same day. I don't really remember exactly. Um, you have a lot of places using both now. Um, they have an IPv6 address and an IPv4 address, or that you've got both set on your PCs and so on. So, and that's where they talk about dual stack, that you can run the two together. You can also tunnel IPv6 across an IPv4 network. So, they work together and we're moving to IPv6. Um, prediction back there in the late 90s in 98, 99, wherever that exact time was, was that we would be totally on IPv6 within no more than five years from now. Uh, needless to say, we're not totally on IPv6 within five years of that date. Because um, we're still predominantly IPv4 today. And my prediction would be that we've got at least five or ten more years of a large amount of IPv4 being used and even AWS is still is encouraging use on IPv4 which you would have thought that might be different um because when you set up a network on the cloud that they give you an IPv4 address and that they tell you to subnet using IPv4 with your IPv4 address um, they don't issue out IPv6 addresses. So, um, and they issue out actually public addresses that they've got a bunch of. Them. So within the last couple of years, a year or two ago, that we actually ran out of IPv4 addresses again up on the distribution level, which they show you in your online materials or book, whatever way you got. Um, now, the dates they've got on their chart there, on their map with names of the organizations here in North America, um, I don't think are right. I'm quite sure that we've lasted longer than what it says. 
because it has like South America exhausted their stuff in 2011. I don't think that date's right in there. I'm not sure where they got these from, but I say it was a year or two ago. It's been recently that um, addresses were run out on IPv4 on the level of these groups. Now, that doesn't mean we've really totally run out of addresses out there because the lower organizations and those organizations actually keep getting addresses given back to them and then they redistribute them and so on down. Um, but they are running that they don't have anything extra sitting around there. Um, the lower ones, the same thing. And most of your ISPs and stuff that do give out um, IPv4 addresses actually have some extra because they got given a chunk that they're not supposed to give out pieces from and that they've all got addresses still sitting there. So today you don't get a class C, B or A address. You only get how many ever addresses you actually really need. And that's just for a few of them. Um, so that's where we stand at today is that things have changed. Um, Internet of Things has been one of the things that could well head us to running out of addresses sooner than anybody thought about back in 99. Um, because the Internet of Things did not exist back then. That was something dreamed and talked about at that point would be something in the science fiction future. And 20 years later, we're there. Um, because you're putting addresses on all kinds of stuff. Um, second part is we are now moving into the space where we're going to put humans in space on other planets and stuff is everything working towards in the very near future. Um, cause SpaceX and the other private company, cause between Bezos company and Musk company, I think SpaceX is Musk and I can't remember what Bezos, um, space company is, um, that they're working both on trying to, probably is put people on Mars still living there and putting people to on the moon. Um, and right now on the Mars one, they're talking more one way travel to there. I'm not real encouraged by that one. Um, they're still trying to figure out all their details on how to do that. Um, so um, be careful what you do illegally because the judge may sentence you to exile on Mars and literally be able to dump you there. <laughs> um, that um, instead of sending you to Siberia, they'll send you to Mars instead with no return trips. Um, so that's all occurring on it and it has caught on um, quite well there. So then they mentioned that there is a NAT type thing called NAT64 that allows you to convert back and forth between the two. But again, the other one is that you're quite often given both a six and a four address. I know Comcast usually hands out to people a six and a four address because I'm pretty sure I've got a six on my machine at home. Um, and then besides having a four and got a lot of the others are also going to giving out sixes, but not all of the ISPs give out six addresses. Um, Cause I have done IP config on different machines and found at different times, some different places don't. Um, Cause it seems like either Ringo telephone or charters not giving them out, which was a, I'm really inclined to think it may be Charter because that was a little bit surprising. The Charter's a national company on as an ISP. Um, and that when Paul Allen owned it, it was trying to stay on the front edges. Of course, Paul Allen's dead now, so there. Mm. Um, that with the IP version 6 addresses, you look at the formatting of them and how you actually see the addresses. They are 128 bits long, but they're expressed in hexadecimal, which was a reason for you learning hexadecimal. Um, and remember, you can express four bits or four, four binary digits into one single hexadecimal digit, um, which is a big reason on that one. So that means you can cut that 128 character of bits down to 
32 um, hexadecimal characters. They're in turn expressed, and each one of those is actually a hex. Um, and those are then split down into groups of four. And then each of those groups of four is a hex tent, just like we talked about octets in IP version four. Okay? Um, so that's four of those. Usually those are separated by colons, although I see sometimes people put dashes between them, but more often that you'll see colons on that switch. I'm pretty sure, I don't know if the standard really says which you should be using. Um, the colon is the more common one on it. Um, but that does make it look sort of like a MAC address, which remember was 12 hexadecimal characters. Um, and it was in groups of two instead. So that's where your giveaway for looking at it's going to be is the length of it and then groups of four or groups of two. Um, and actually that MAC address can be used and it is all used a lot of times as part of that of the IP version six address. Um, because that's how we'll do one of the ways to automatic addressing out there for the machines is where it uses the um tell your machine to be nice to me that i really am not me and that i'm not going to hurt it um so you'll express it there as that however you can express the addresses much shorter so they talk about rule one and rule two in the book and these are real rules Okay, so rule one and rule two are things you do need to be for sure to remember. They call it preferred format when you put it out there in that long approach there. Um, I'm not exactly sure why you would call that preferred format of having it in long form. But that's in long form. That's including every character in it. What the first rule, rule one, and there's two rules, is all we got to remember. Rule one is that leading zeros in each hex tet can be dropped. Now, let me mention one other thing on hex tet. Um, a lot of the dictionary, online dictionaries, do not recognize that term. And they'll try to tell you misspelled it, H-E-X-T-E-T. -E but yet they'll tell you that octet, O-C-T-E-T, -E is spelled correctly. And oddly enough, I'm pretty sure Microsoft's online dictionary is one that doesn't know about Hextet, oddly enough. Um, but um, so you can present, show whatever, dropping the leading zeros on each Hextet because there's separate groups of numbers in there. Okay, and remember each Hextet's really two bytes long. Okay, um, because it's four hexadecimal characters. Um, so if it was zero zero nine zero, you could express it as just nine zero. So you can drop off all the leading zeros, except for if it has all zeros, you still got to put a zero. Okay, so you can't drop the the last character has to still be there. So um, if it was zero 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 nine, you could express that as nine. But if it was zero 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 then you have to express it um, as zero, okay? So that's the first one. So you can reduce them down tremendously right there. That makes it a whole lot smaller and not as and confusing and look like it's intimidating to people. Um, second rule is that we can actually use a double colon in there. When you have several zero, all zero ones in there, you can double colon. Um, so if you had in the middle of the address, uh, four zeros, colon, four zeros, colon, four zeros, instead of putting those 12 zeros in there, you could just put colon, colon, and leave out those 12 zeros. Now, if you have groups, several groups of multiple four zeros, you can only do it on one group. Now think about it. 
that rule's got to be that way because otherwise you wouldn't know how many of them goes in one spot and how many of them goes in the other spot. Um, so you only do it one time in there. Okay, so the double colon can only be used once, but the double colon will let us eliminate all zero segments. And even if it's just one all zero segment, Um, y'all are all having problems, and then my phone last night decided that it didn't like the charging cord plugged into it and dropped it out. And so my, when I got up this morning, I had a 3% charge on my phone. However, at this point, my phone is charging now, and I'm up to 50%. So I do have some charge on it now. Um, but, um, so the double colon one is really neat on that one. And the ultimate neatness on that one is the loopback address. And remember on IP version four, I said loopback addresses where any addresses to start with 127. And so 127 dot something dot something dot something. And it could be any combination of those. So the most commonly you use the 127.0.0.1. Okay. And that was an inefficiency on IP version four, because you just used up 16 million addresses there, of where most of the time nobody uses more than one or two, or usually no more than one loopback address. Okay, because actually when you set loopback objects on your routers and stuff, and I don't remember, I don't think y'all have done that yet, but you for sure will do it if you take Cisco 2, 2452, um, that you'll put loopback objects on your routers and switches, which will be where you don't really have a device there, but you're testing with something that looks like a device there. And you can actually use real addresses on those. So, But um, loopback address is one where you can test to see if you can make contact with your network card or your, and I say card in a very liberal sense there, um, whatever the type connection, whether it be built into the motherboard or whatever. Okay. Um, and then it, bounces back at you to tell you that you successfully reached the network connection, okay, without going actually to the actual address on it. Uh, just did you meet, reach the physical part that used to be a separate card there, which was a big part on that. Um, but the address in IP version 6 is the only IP version 6 address I can tell you that I know. And it is... 31 zeros followed by a one. So that's seven groups of, that's 15 groups of zeros, um, four zeros each. And then the last one, zero, 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 one. Now, using our rules, rule one and rule two, we can cut that address down completely to colon, colon, one. And colon, colon, one, is a whole lot shorter, and I'm just going to put that in chat in case any of you are sitting there trying to figure out exactly what I just said. Um, that's a whole lot shorter than those 31 zeros followed by a one. So you can, and that's the ultimate on reducing how the address looks is on that look back address. Um, and that's why I can remember that one. And I actually have seen that one on a certification test before. I saw that one and I went, ooh, neat. Um, and the public ones start with something like zero, the private addresses actually start with zero D6 or something like that. And they don't even mention that um, from what I remember in the book. Zero D, and I can't remember what it is. Um, and so, is there throwing you some FB ones? And it's not really shown to you when in here. So, um, then they talk about your address types, and you have, remember in IP version 4, we had unicast, multicast, and broadcast. In IP version 6, We've got unicast, multicast, and anycast. Now, unicast is the same as what we were talked about in IP version four. That's where you're sending to a single machine. So it specifically identifies a single interface out there somewhere on there. Um, 
multicast is used to send a single IP version 6 um, packet to multiple destinations. Well, that was what IP version 4 did um, with multicast, but that also includes an IP version 6 broadcast or actually part of multicast now. So then the third one is anycast, um, which is um, another type addressing that sort of like multicast, but as they put it, that's going well beyond what we're doing in this course and actually well beyond what we're going to get really into anycast on along in the three CCNA courses. But it's there, so be aware there is any cast. Also, be aware that any cast is not the same as broadcast, which is a lot what a lot of people want to do because that would be obvious off that. Um, so, know those three, but notice they don't spend a whole lot of time on them. Um, so, um, and notice they do make the comment that I made to you also. If you're going to do a broadcast in IP version 6, you'll actually use multicast to do that. Um, now, as you look at these addresses, and remember we've said that they come out with eight groups, eight hex tests. Here's a number combination you do need to remember. 314, because that's going to be how your addresses are going to be set up is that you're going to have three hex tets that's going to be your network address which if you remember in IP version 4 that varied depending on the class you were in of how many octets made up the network in IP version 6 the first three hex tets is the network portion the fourth hex tet I mentioned it back in IP version 4 to you because this is the one that a lot of people love about IP version 6. And y'all have made it through chapter 11, the end of chapter 11. So this one, you should be to the point where you can love it too. IP version 6, you don't have to worry about anything about subnetting that we did in chapter 11. That's IP version 4. IP version 6, the fourth hex tet, and we're working from the left, is the subnetting hex tet. And you just number your subnets in there. That allows you to have up to 65,536, I think it's 36, 36 or 35, subnets per network. Todd, do you have any need for 66,000 subnets? No, sir. Not at this point. Okay, good. Um, when you get to that demand, we'll probably be on IP version 7 and we'll take care of it. Okay. Um, that may be beyond all of our lives here in the class. Okay. I don't know of any place that needs 10,000 subnets. Okay. Um, I'm not going to say there's not, but if you need 10,000 subnets, my suggestion to you is you might want to look at how you're setting up your network in the first place again. Okay. Um, just maybe. Um, and that would take care of just using not the regular decimal numbers in your that hex tip. But when you use the A through F, you can get 65,000 of them. So there's no worry, no need to do subdating anymore when you do IP version 6. And I could hear all of y'all sigh a relief on that one. Okay. Um, so, and then the last four hex tets, which will be your last 64 bits, that's going to be your host address. Now, there's several ways. Now, they talk about different types of unicast addresses, um, and they got all of these different ones. And to be perfectly honest with you, I can't remember on these. And if I took the test with y'all, I would miss some of the questions too. Okay. Is that they got all of these new ones. The loop back one, I told you I can remember that one. Okay. Um, the other part is for the purposes of marking which part is the network 
on it in IP version four, we had the issue of that you had either longhand or shorthand that you either that when you put the addresses into Cisco devices, you have to use the longhand address um, where you do the 255.255.255.0 or something like that, where yeah. when you put it into some other devices and where it's written down most commonly, they just do it as a slash and how many ever um, bit positions are crossed on there, okay? IP version six is just slash and the number of bit positions. So you're gonna see slash 64 normally expressed on the addresses. The other nice part is all of them all use the shorthand method to put it in. So if you go to put a IP version 6 address into the Cisco device or into Windows, which you can do, just go choose IP version V6, Internet Protocol V6, instead of Internet Protocol V4, when you're going in putting in addresses and you'll get the part to put in your um, IP version 6 addresses and you'll see that it's just got a small little block there for and shows a slash in front of it usually that you type in the number of what's that on it which normally is going to be 64 okay so that becomes easier for you um the global unicast and the link local are the two that are normally used on there okay and that the global unicast is for when it sends it out globally, that's the address that's referenced on it. So you're actually gonna have two IP version six addresses on a machine, that global unicast and then the link local. The link local is used within your network. So it's got a global type address and it's got a local address. I'm not quite sure on that, but. That goes back to the fact they got tons of addresses and they went all kinds of ways on it. Um, and then the unique local is one, if I'm remembering right, is not used currently. Um, but the global and the link local are, but the unique local is one that's not really out there. Okay. Um, And there the book mentions about RFC 1918, which we've already talked about. So they actually do mention that one to you. But remember, that's the public private addressing in IP version four. Oddly enough, they throw it to you in the chapter on IP version six. Okay. So they go through on that, but what will happen quite often, and in the first hex tet, they've got a part there that tells you about what your global global address is, and that's really going to be where you're going to get between those two addresses of the link local and the global unique address, the GUA, um, is that leading off part. Um, but here's the other part, and they then start showing you that you do have a subnet ID in there, and I have seen a number of times questions in terms of 314, of knowing how that broad scheme of how the address is set up of network subnet and the host address on it. Now for the host address, there are several ways that you can generate that you can get that address on there. So you really don't, there is a DHCP for version six, but it is not used very much. And it's actually mentioned here in the book um, that um, DHCP could be used but um, it's a little bit different on how it works on assigning out addresses, and it's got to sign a little bit more to it. Um, so that um, they mention about that you can do it with the RS and RAs, router solicitation, router access, that's really doing off the line of DHCP, pulling it back from the server. But what's normally going to happen is it's going to get a network address and then it's going to create its own host address. Well, we already have a unique host address out there that we didn't use on as far as level, um, as far as the level three in our OSI model on the network layer, the layer three. Um, and that is the MAC address, which is layer two, where it's normally used. 
but it's a totally unique address that no other machine has that address, no other device connected to a network has that address. So what they will actually do is use that address in there and then it flips one of the bits and I don't think the book tells you which bit it flips. Um, but one of the bits it actually flips when it goes to use the MAC addresses part of the host address and adds a couple of other little things onto it around it but basically the host address in a lot of cases is using the mac address with a bit flipped in it um not exactly i've heard at one time why you flipped the bit but i can't remember what the reason was for flipping that single bit in there um Partly, I think it is to make it where it will not be the MAC address, so there's not confusion as the packets and frames are being looked at on it. Um, but I can't remember exactly what, but it will use that quite often and doing, and it does that in terms of doing Slack. And so they mentioned Slack to you, which is the stateless address auto configuration. DHCP would be stateful because it is assigning out specific addresses. This is stateless because it's not specific addresses coming from central source, but they're being built for it. Um, and that it builds, it creates its own doing without the services of DHCP version six, but it is getting the network address from the server and builds it itself. Um, and so it can create it. So most commonly out there, what you're going to see is Slack used, although they mentioned that you could use a combination of Slack and DHCP version 6, or you could use DHCP version 6, um, which sends specific addresses to the machine and is a stateful approach. Although DHCP version 6 can be used stateless with Slack, and Slack has two A's in it, just for y'all's information. Um, so it's S-L-A-A-C-K. But of the things I've attended on IP version 6, um, Slack has always talked about. DHCP is hardly ever mentioned. Um, I gave y'all in the class also a large PowerPoint from back in probably 2012 or so. Um, it was actually the last Cisco academy conference they had and it was at cisco headquarters um that the author of a previous version of the third of the fourth cisco book was talking with me that i attended his talk actually he and i talked at breakfast that morning he said i knew a good bit about ipv6 already and i told him i was going to his session on that right after breakfast um because they served us breakfast every morning at the campus and that he went through and showed how it all works. I don't have a recording of him, but I do have all the slides and he told me I was welcome to use them. So I've actually got them sitting in there. You may want to look at those and it may help you on it. It made perfect sense to me that day when I went through on it. I wished it still made perfect sense, but it did. Um, so that is the process on the whole thing. And then they go through and lead you through a little bit more on generating addresses in the chapter. Um, and they actually even talk about subnetting an IP version 6 network at the end of the chapter. But again, just number your nut, your subnets and you put the number there in the fourth hex tip and you've got it done. So there's nothing complicated about subnetting um, an IPv6 network. Um, I've talked longer than I thought I would be talking, but I made it through the chapter. Um, so I wouldn't panic a lot on this test. Remember, this is just one of 17 tests, I believe it is. So I think I've got 17 chapters in this book. Um, so it's not that much. So if you miss some of the questions on it, don't go being out of shape. Y'all may get it down better than I've got it down at this point. I'll get better and then I don't. I don't use IP36, so that's my problem, that I'm not using it and so not catching and keeping myself straight in my head on all of it. Because after all, I'm teaching a wide range of things besides yeah. having how to use Blackboard, which isn't even one of 
the things I'm supposed to be teaching. Um, and actually, I help other instructors with that one. Um, and then nowadays, in the last year, although I was doing beforehand, um, because before I was, have been using Collaborate for several years, for about four years now, I think. Um, but using it much more extensively now. But I'm also having to use and do presentations through Zoom because I did one last Saturday for the Georgia Kiwanis on cybersecurity. And I was using Zoom. And that's the first time I've actually done a presentation in a room on Zoom. And that was rather neat using the rooms um, that they put us into rooms and then brought us all back together. Um, I've used WebEx. I have to use WebEx when I do presentations for people here at school. Um, because the school has a requirement, we either have to use WebEx or we have to use um, Collaborate. Although there are some people griping on that that want us to use Teams. I actually have taught in the last year several classes for Chat State, just one class a semester. This semester, I'm not teaching anything for them, or summer, <coughs> got scheduled for fall, um, and they use Teams. So I have to use that to do these live sessions. I've, I've done for CompTIA, where I've done several things for them, I used ON24. So all of those mm. to drive me crazy. Um, and then IP version 4, IP version 6, and <coughs> server classes, we moved, are moved from 2012 to 2016 this semester. Um, so I'm having to get that one down. And then I do SQL once a year, so on. Um, so there's a ton of information I do web pages for different people out there. So I got HTML floating in my head too. So um, it all fits in there. But I try to keep it all up with it. Um, and right now I um, need to review real quick and I got to see how quick my voucher dies for an Amazon certification for my second one with them. And I just took this class on Security Plus, which technically ended last Thursday, but I missed the session last Thursday <coughs> in North Carolina. So I've still got to catch that session this afternoon. And then they'll give me a voucher for Security Plus, and I want to go take that with the latest version of Security Plus, although I'm not going to really study study for that. Um, and I've got a voucher for CYSA I've got to use by this summer. And I need to be studying on that one because I'd love to get that one. Um, and I need to do some practice tests on it. Um, and actually, I've got some now available to me because I took a subscription out with WizLabs. I was trying to think what was the name of it again. And now I remember. And WizLabs, a lot of people have told me, has some really good practice tests and stuff. And they charge $99 a year to access all of their materials. Um, actually, I got it for seventy nine dollars. Um, and my phone just decided that it had moved and flashed up the no touch screen. Um, I was wondering why it tapped me, and it is sitting there on the desktop beside me. So either I did not notice the earthquake that just hit, apparently, or something. Um, but the phone thought it moved. <laughs> um, any questions for me today? Next week, there it goes again. I don't know what it thinks its problem is. Um, oh, there's some text did come in. Um, next week is spring break. Um, I'm probably, I will not be online much. I'm intending to take the whole week off for leave. Um, Tuesday, I will be getting my second COVID shot. Um, nice. hoping that goes well, although that's the one that a lot of people seem to have problems with. Um, so I'm hoping that I just got to take the time out to go get the shot and that it doesn't make me sick the rest of that day or for a couple of days or whatever, like some <coughs> other report. Um, and otherwise, I'm planning to get away a little bit and stuff for the week. So, so next week we don't have class? So there's no class next week because that's student holidays all next week. So then we have a test by Monday so evening. Test, anything that you would have thought was due this coming Monday, like the Chapter 12 test, will mm -hmm. not be until the following Monday. So the 10, 10 11, and 12 exam, so isn't I, that what? 
next one is. is that, do y'all have a t test on 10, 11, and 12? I'm not sure. Uh, I just nope. closed that window. Uh-uh, you don't have a test on 10, 11, 12. Your next test. Your next test is 11 through 13 is the next test, and it's due on the following week on the 12th. Getting tested on 10? Um, matter of fact, y'all don't even have a lab on chap module 12 either. But we have them on 11, right? Which I haven't done, and I sent you an email already. So I sent you an email. And and <laughs> there was one on 11. Yeah. Was, there was one on 12. There was a module, and that's 11, correction. So there was one on 11, but there is not one on 12. And the uh, 11 one was due yesterday. So if I, if I do 11 tonight, which I'll have internet back up, I moved over the weekend. So I moved from uh, Rossville over to Dalton, and... Uh, we had a downsize, but anyway, I'm getting internet hooked up today between 12 and 5 p.m. So I haven't done anything because I've been moving stuff. Um, I dislocated my knee. Uh, when was it? Friday night when the rain came, I was moving furniture and I dislocated it. So I'm going to try to hit it tonight as soon as I get internet access. <clears throat> but uh, I am behind. So if I do okay. 11... Can I do get, 11 and still get a discount? Uh, uh, like a, you'll get on the 11. If you turn it in today, that's or, for that matter, any time before April the 5th, because that's actually one week, um, okay. that it will lose the 15 points that Silva says you lose per week. 15 points, okay. So the late penalty, it's better than losing all the points. Because mm -hmm, I will take work late from y'all, but it is a 15-point penalty per week. That's right. I got. I got to get it done. Um, test. I'll take late also, but you have to write me and tell me that you want to take the test so I can activate it for you. That okay. on the tests that are taken late, but assignments. The Dropbox stays open in my class, and then okay. when I grade them, that I see when they were submitted, and I dock off points accordingly. Okay, sounds good. But they. But you can still turn them in. Um, and then. All right. Sounds good. Thank you. Okay. Um, and again, on one or two assignments, that's not going to, somebody was just a little bit late and just lost that amount. That doesn't kill you because you notice you've got a lot of grades that you get in my class. Okay. Yeah. And the percentage each thing counts. The things you've got to make sure you do do on time is when we get down to the final exam and the final lab, and I've got to make a decision real quick on what we're going to do on that. Um, which I'll probably do when after we get back. That um, I'm probably going to let y'all give y'all the option of either doing a lab that I put out there for you, a packet tracer activity, or you coming in and doing making the three cables for me. Um, nice. and that I'll meet students at different campuses on that because it looks like we're moving into a safer environment now and that we can do that better. Because as a matter of fact, the school is offering some class. They told us all to see on what classes we could offer in person in the summer. And then fall, we're supposed to be back to normal on how we offer classes. So some stuff online, some stuff off. Um, in person, just like we've always done in the past. Um, but some are not quite as much of the in person. In my case, I'm still going to be online summer because everything I'm teaching in the summer is I've always normally taught it online anyway. So that doesn't make a big difference to me. But we did like the CIST 1122, the hardware installation class. That goes back to being an in-person class in summer. So, um, 
which is the way we've always had that class. But during the last year, we obviously had to change. But now it'll be a hybrid class again, where you'll do have to go to class for part of um, And then when I teach this class again next spring, I'll be have it online and in person. Although this spring I really am teaching and in person, it's just not available, but to a select group that the high school said they wanted it in person for me teaching to them for the Katusa school system. And so I have been teaching it actually in person. But for college students, the ones that are the River College students, not in the, that set up there, all of y'all had to do it online. Because I know several of y'all would have rather had me do it in person. But that's the way it goes. All right. Any other questions for me? So have a good break next week. Um, I could have buried y'all with work for these two weeks, but I didn't. Um, and then um, I say what's in 12 is just a piece of what's going to be on that test anyway. So. Um, don't bury yourself completely. When we get into 13 ICMP, that one will get back to you, relate much better to you. Also happens to be a very short chapter, um, but we'll cover different things on ICMP, which primarily is looking at ping and trace route. Okay. I'm not sure why they got a whole chapter on ICMP there, but they do. Um, so that one's going to be a very light chapter on that after this. So 11 and 12, the 11 was really, really heavy in my opinion. 12's got all these new different things about IPv6. Um, but since you don't know IPv, IP before this, it probably is not as confusing to most of you that did not know anything about IP. Um, as it is to those of us that have dealt with IPv4 for a number of years of the changes to it that um, probably for the newer ones it's less of a challenge. All right and given that I'm going to let y'all go it says it's almost 12 o'clock so we have run almost a full hour um, and so I see Jennifer came in at the last minute, so let me add her on the list. Um, Jennifer, make sure you put something in the chat window for me, because all of you do need to be putting something in there every week. Um, so there, you got something in there. Okay. Um, I think I answered on everything through here, mostly our conversation on the chat window and stuff was having dying batteries or bad connections etc um which really had nothing to do exactly with the chapter so y'all have a good week or two weeks and i will see y'all two weeks from today the other one is 1918 not 1819 um world war one okay <laughs> that's what the guy told us to remember on okay nice because <laughs> that was in the war um the uh, and then the other one that was about setting up the routers and stuff is 1812 and that's back to when the british burned the white house and this is a guy in britain teaching the class so obviously <laughs> he had to write that one in um 1812, they burned the White House? Actually, 18, I think they burned the White House actually like 1811, because the War of 1812, but if I remember right, that's when that war ended, was 1812, because I think that Andrew Jackson's Battle of New Orleans was in 1812 also, and that was actually a month after the war ended. Wow. When the Battle of New Orleans occurred, they'd already signed a peace agreement between the U.S. and the British, and we had the big battle down there that made Andrew Jackson famous and got him the presidency. Um, one, one, one. 
I was a history minor in college, just in case y'all didn't figure that one out. Well, you're a nerd, and that's the way it goes, right? <laughs> we are all nerds. Now y'all got the rest of the story today, as Paul Harvey would have told you. That's right. Very good. All right. Thank you. So I'm going to stop.